without keeping them safe, there was potential for them to not even make it to the start line. And that was our key focus, was making sure they had that opportunity to perform. They are elite athletes in every sense of the word. They're just the same as their Olympic counterparts. And um, they dealt with the changes and the challenges uh, so brilliantly. And so I, I don't feel like um, their disabilities came into play at all. I think a lot of them as well are not just telling their story, they're also showing young kids out there with disabilities uh, what their lives can be. It's reality TV at its best. Our athletes were tremendous and they gave us so many thrills. The classification system, whilst not 100% perfect in Paralympic sport, it groups like athletes with like athletes. So you, don't, you can remove that element of it and just concentrate on the performance. The interesting thing about the Paralympics, Tim, is that there'd be a lot of parents that would be worried about their, their young children who have got a disability. They would have been watching that thinking, you know, there's nothing that my son or daughter can't do. Welcome to Onside, the official podcast of Sport Integrity Australia. Our mission is to protect the integrity of sport and the health and welfare of those who participate in Australian sport. Hello and welcome to the final episode in the Clean and Gold series as we reflect on the Tokyo Paralympics and look ahead to next year's Winter Paralympics, Parasport, next year's Commonwealth Games and the Paris Paralympics in 2024. As well, we're going to have a little look at the Tokyo Olympic Games with one of our guests, commentator Dave Colbert. They've not only commentated the Paralympics, but also the Olympic Games. I'm Tim Gable. Alongside me is the triple Olympic gold medalist, Sport Integrity Australia's Petrea Thomas. And Petrea, what a month it was of sport. Quite incredible. Oh, it was amazing. It's hard to believe there was such a big build up to it. Now it's all done and dusted for three years this time, not four. But um, look, it was fantastic. And I think particularly um, given the circumstances we're all in within Australia, a lot of people in lockdown during the Games, it was a great opportunity to be able to support our teams from afar and, and really get to have a much greater insight, I think, into the, the Games, both the Olympics and Paralympics, with the, um, the, the amount of coverage that we're all getting in our, uh, to our screens back home. Yes, the Paralympics are totally different in terms of a concept to the Olympic Games, weren't they? And that was pretty borne out by the, the coverage on Channel 7. Uh, but they focused very much on the performance of the athletes, which I thought was great. Yeah, it's terrific. Look, the Paralympics have come a long, long way in the time that I've been around um, sport and um, it's it's very professional now and, and the athletes are taken for what they are, which is great athletes. And I think that's a, a real evolution with Paralympic sport and I think it's um, really celebrated. And, you know, the, the you know, that all athletes have got a story to tell, but just the, the amount of... Um, uh, challenges that some of our Paralympic athletes have to overcome is just immense and, and yet they're still out there, they're still doing their best, they still train hard and they get out and represent their country with a hell of a lot of pride. Thanks, Patrick. Shortly we're going to be joined by the chef de mission for the Australian team at the Tokyo Paralympics, Kat McLaughlin, who's going to reflect on what happened in Tokyo and the former long jumper now sports commentator Dave Colbert, who commentated on both the Olympics and the Paralympics for Channel 7. Well, this is Sport Integrity Australia's Clean and Gold podcast series. I'm Tim Gable, alongside Sport Integrity Australia's Patria Thomas. Now, Australia finished the Tokyo Paralympics with 21 gold medals, 29 silver and 30 bronze. The performance of the Australian team inspired the nation, but the Paralympics weren't without its challenges. In the midst of a COVID pandemic, Australia's chef de mission was Kate McLaughlin. And Kate is with us now. And Kate, how hard was it to manage the team at these Paralympics? Uh, look, at the Games themselves, it wasn't too bad. I think that the main challenge for us was the build-up, just planning for every eventuality in, in a pandemic um, and, and just that constant change. I guess there was, you know, not a lot of international competition for our athletes in the lead-up. Qualification became quite difficult. There was constant changes to nomination criteria. You know, teams weren't able to get together and train. You know, all the, all the normal things, I guess, that most athletes had to deal with in the last 12 to 18 months. Um, made it very difficult to, to plan for these games. 
uh, from a Paraly Paralympic perspective. Logistically, though, you had to keep the athletes safe, but also give them space to perform, didn't you? Yeah, we did. So, I mean, look, there were a number of um, protocols that we needed to put in place, which was sort of above and beyond what the organising committee had set in stone. Uh, so things like, you know, we didn't allow them to use the dining hall. We didn't allow them to march in the opening or closing ceremonies, which was really difficult. They were really difficult decisions to make. Uh, but with the advice that we had, we really wanted to try and keep them as safe as possible uh, because without keeping them safe, there was potential for them to not even make it to the start line. And that was our key focus, was making sure they had that opportunity to perform. Kate, obviously, you know, the challenges were immense and we're facing some of those same challenges leading into Birmingham next year. I mean, how how was it all received by the athletes? I mean, to me, they seem just to be very grateful to be there and be able to compete and represent their country. They dealt with it incredibly well. I was really worried, particularly, I guess, for those that have been to multiple Paralympic Games before, because there's a certain expectation around what a village looks like and how a village functions. Um, so I was concerned around the, you know, the different overlay we had to put in place. Um, but they were brilliant. And I think they all very early on understood exactly why we'd put things in place the way we had. I think the, the key to that was communicating with them. We had uh, regular monthly catch-ups with the entire team uh, for six months in the lead up to these games and really tried to make sure that they understood uh, exactly what they were, you know, were managing their expectations, I guess, for when they got there so that they could focus fully on on field of play and, and getting their performances together whilst we were in the background making sure they were kept safe. What was the most challenging aspect, do you think? Uh, because uh, Paralympians, by their very nature, often need support. Um, as opposed to able-bodied athletes. It's, such a, it's a totally different scenario, isn't it, for, for a Paralympic chef to mission? Yeah, look, it, it was different. It was character building, that's for sure. Um, I think the, the main thing uh, that was the most challenging for me was just the constant change. So we would have a plan put in place and then only 24 hours later something would shift and that plan was no longer relevant. Um, so in the in the lead up, we had we did a huge amount of scenario planning um, to make sure that we were kind of almost a step ahead. A step ahead. Um, our athletes, whilst they do have disabilities, that certainly, you know, it, it didn't really come into play. I'll be honest. These, these games, um, they are elite athletes in every sense of the word. They're just the same as their Olympic counterparts, and um, they dealt with the changes and the challenges. Uh, so brilliantly and so I, I don't feel like um, their disabilities came into play at all. I think it was more just making sure that we constantly pivoted, responded to the challenges or the changes to, to planning that was put in place and did it in a really seamless way that meant that they weren't, um, their performances weren't impacted at all. Did you write the letters to every athlete like you did in the lead up to Rio? I did, I did. Um, I. <laughs> oh, I did it to just, not just athletes, to all officials. So 348 letters. Oh, okay. um, so uh, that was, yeah, halfway through again, I, I kind of said to myself, what are you doing, Kate? But, um, <laughs> but no, they were really well received. And I think particularly in this campaign with the challenges that people have faced, it was really nice for, them, or nice for me to be able to thank them for their contribution, not just athletes, but also the officials that uh, put their lives on hold for a lot longer than they signed up for, that's for sure. Kate? You know, I'm friends with you on Facebook and I, I see how, you know, proud you are of, of the team and the way it performed. But can you just tell us in your own words, you know, just how proud you are of, of what what the, the whole group as a, as a whole was able to achieve? Oh, it's hard to put into words, Petraea, because they, they just um, – what everybody, and I'm not just our athletes, but the whole of Australia has been through and the whole world has been through over the past 18 months is just unprecedented. And I think there was every chance that people would look at the challenge of Tokyo and just go, it's too hard. Um, but not one of our team did. I think, you know, there are some amazing performances out there. I was so proud of, you know, what they were able to leave out on the field. They, I don't think any of them uh, didn't put their heart and soul into each and every performance. Um, I know that, there, you know, we had, I think, 29 silver medals. And I know a lot of those people probably would have loved to have seen those as gold. But the reality is that Paralympic sport has just exploded and you know the the improvements in athletes around the world has just improved ex exponentially um but i'm just so proud of the way they held themselves the way that they spoke when they were interviewed the way you know the the fondness they explained you know, they have for the rest of their teammates and that, that camaraderie we have within the australian paralympic team and 
Uh, they just represented Australia so beautifully and I could not have been more proud of, of how we represented uh, this Games. It seemed to be a real focus on ability rather than disability at these Games. Was that a conscious effort or is it a, a bit of an evolution there because you know, 20 years ago it wouldn't have been a similar focus? Uh, look, it's, it's certain, I think it's been a conscious effort from us from Paralympics Australia's perspective over the last couple of Games to make sure that they are genuinely seen as as elite athletes um, in, in comparison to their, their uh, able-bodied counterparts. But I think the media, for some reason, there was this massive shift and I feel like there was there was a turning point in their disabilities weren't the things that they were focusing on. They were genuinely focusing on their ability, or, you know, or their, their performances. Um, and even, you know, the, the way that we were portrayed in the media, everyday Australians weren't going, oh, my gosh, that they're, you know, Look what they look what they look like, or look what their disability is, or look what their story is. They were genuinely looking and saying that's an amazing performance in its own right. I think every athlete has a story to to tell, whether you're Olympic or Paralympic. Um, but our athletes just, yeah, there was definitely a shift from a media perspective for sure, Tim. Yeah, Kate, I think the stories you touched on are just, you know, every every athlete has their story, but some of the challenges that our Paralympic athletes have to overcome are just immense and I know I certainly draw a lot of inspiration from their stories and and what they're able to achieve as you say they're all elite athletes and they're all out there um, performing giving it their all and representing their country with with absolute pride and I think um, I just wanted to make that point because you know that there there's stories of courage and um, per persistence and overcoming challenges are just incredible yeah they certainly are I think um yeah <laughs> The way in which they're able to tell their story too and to I think a lot of them as well are not just telling their story they're also showing young kids out there with disabilities uh, what their lives can be um, you know and I, I totally appreciate that every single person in Australia with a disability is not going to become a Paralympic athlete um, but I guess what they're what they're showing them is that you know there's more to life than just being someone with a disability there's things you can achieve which are you know pretty impressive. What was the reaction um Obviously, you know, we felt it back in Australia watching on television, but within the Games management team, what sort of response was there towards you from Australia? Did you did you get a huge response from here? It wasn't confined to Australia, but you actually felt it over there? Yeah, look, we did, Tim. We we didn't get a lot of the Channel 7 coverage uh, over in at the Games. We, ha we had live feeds coming through and we were able to see it, but, you know, as... As you guys know, when you're at a Games, you're so busy, you don't get time to sit down and watch TV and see what the Australian reaction has been. But I think we were all pretty overwhelmed with how, the feedback we were getting from home. The fact that there was 14 hours of, of coverage um, in Australia, the fact that people were in lockdown and not able to go anywhere, I think that, that was a, an amazing advantage in a way. It's silver lining for us. I know not great for people back in Australia, but but amazing that there were so many more eyeballs on, on our Paralympic team than ever before. Um, and hopefully like a realisation of, you know, what an amazing team it is. So, yeah, look, we certainly felt that. We felt that um, that spirit. We had a lot of uh, prominent Australians jumping on daily calls with our team as well. And they were, you know, letting us know what the feedback was like from Australia, which was just so lovely. And I think it really buoyed our team in, at a time when, you know, they were walking out into stadiums with no spectators, which would have been very bizarre for a lot of our sports um, to not have that, that not just spectators in the stands but you know the family and friends weren't able to travel across so to know that they that the response from general Australians has been so good was just you know fantastic for our team. I notice you're also now the chef commission for the Winter Paralympics next year um, either a glutton for punishment or you feel as though you're in a little <laughs> bit of a role um, but you've got you've got the Winter Paralympics you've got the Paris sports of course at the Commonwealth Games and then you've got obviously World Championships then you've got the Paris Paralympics in 2024, it, it, it is quite relentless now, isn't it? It is, although I know Patria's got Birmingham covered, so I don't need to worry so much about that. But, yeah, look, it, it's going to be a busy couple of years. I think sometimes when we come back from a, a summer Paralympic Games, we generally have a, one year, and it's not a slowdown, but it's certainly there's a little bit of a, a buffer, um, but there's certainly no buffer this time around. In six months' time, we'll be off to Beijing for the Winter Games. Uh, there's a lot to be done in the next couple of months before our winter athletes start to head overseas for the Northern Hemisphere season. 
um, and we probably won't see them again until we actually see them in Beijing. So there's there's a huge amount of work, regardless of the fact that um, the, the team size will be quite a lot smaller. Uh, it's the same overlay, no, no matter whether you've got a team size of 14 or 20 to, you know, team size of 400. Uh, and then, yes, Paris. I mean, we, we were having meetings for both Beijing and Paris at the Games in, in Tokyo. So we've already had to, you know, start to decide on our allotment within the village in Paris. And we're very much um, a way along the path to uh, planning for the Paris Games. So it's certainly no rest. Um, but that's OK. That's the way we like it. <laughs> Enjoy your two weeks in uh, hotel quarantine while you can, Kate. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I suppose, it, what tips have you got for me as a, as a chef de mission going into my first games in, in Birmingham as, as the team leader? What, what tips can you give me and how can I make it a success? I think we need to have a big sit down, Patria. <laughs> oh, that's coming. No, no, no. no, no. <laughs> Look, you're an amazing leader and I'm sure you've got this covered, but, you know, I, there's, there's so many things that I'm sure that you had already thought about, you know, if we, with your involvement from the Gold Coast um, games as well. But look, I think the key thing for me, particularly in this COVID environment, and I, I hate to say it, but it's probably going to be, there's going to be shades of it still in Birmingham. I'm sure that's something that you guys are planning for as well. Hopefully it won't be anything like as intense as it was for Tokyo. Um, but I think the key thing is just communicating with the team constantly. I think that the one thing I think really played into our hands is making sure that we had we were being really transparent with the team at all times about what our plans were and what managing expectations around how we were going to manage the team. Um, but uh, you've got an amazing team behind you as well, Patria, and I'm no doubt that Birmingham, in spite of the small challenges, will be a fantastic game. And I know our athletes, our para athletes, are really looking forward to being integrated into that team again. Yeah, it's one thing I loved about the games on the Gold Coast is, you know, have the, the para-athletes been involved. And to be honest, we didn't even think of them as para-athletes. They were just athletes on the team, um, all working hard to try and do their country proud. And that's certainly the approach we'll be taking into to Birmingham as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's it's a lovely um it's a lovely mix in that Commonwealth Games environment. And um, yeah, really grateful for the the way that you've uh, welcomed that that group of athletes into your team. Kate, uh, thanks very much for joining us today on Onsite's Clean and Gold podcast series and uh, well done on your job in Tokyo and I guess uh, you've got to hit the ground running now for the Winter Paralympics in Beijing. But thanks very much for joining us uh, on the Clean and Gold series. Thanks so much for having me, Tim and Patria. Thanks, Kate. Lovely to talk to you. You're listening to Onside, the official podcast of Sport Integrity Australia. This is Sport Integrity Australia's final episode in the Clean and Gold podcast series with Tim Gable and Patria Thomas. And joining us now is the former long jumper commentator, Dave Colbert. Dave commentated at both the Olympics and Paralympics in Tokyo for Channel 7. Dave, thanks for joining us. And firstly, how hard was it to commentate of television back in Melbourne for both the, the Olympics and the Paralympics, I'd imagine particularly hard in some of those distance events. Um, thanks, Tim. Hi, Patria. Well, look, it's it's not a, it's not the preferred place to be, that's for sure. The stadium's the best place to be. But in some events and some sports, like triathlon, for instance, or um, the road events, or even canoe slalom, um, the, we wouldn't have been at the venue anyway. So I guess in that cir circumstance, you know, you're calling from what you see. Um, certainly the distance races are, are very challenging because you can only see what you can see on your um, monitor. Um, and so if an Australian athlete isn't in the top two or three, then that can be pretty challenging. And in fact, we're really lucky with Pat Tin and that we only saw what happened to him when he fell over at the Olympics on a separate camera feed that we had that um, was, I could see, but Bruce and Tamsin couldn't see because they were concentrating on another screen. Um, so there are moments like that that make it a little challenging. You certainly feel removed from the action, but look at the end of the day when the when the the, the red light goes on, as they say, um, and you're on air, you know you're you're pretty up and about for it because it's the it's reality TV at its best. Our athletes were tremendous and they gave us so many thrills. So you know at the end of the day, it was um, it was uh, not ideal, but I think we made the most of it. You uniquely placed to look at both the Olympics and the Paralympics as a commentator because you did both. 
two totally different events. You can't really compare them, can you? Um, no, they are completely different because the you know the you're always searching as a commentator for the what's the backstory, what's the story, what's the human interest story, and at the Olympics, um, you know it it's a pretty high bar to find the story that's actually interesting um, because there's not that many of them because athletes are athletes, they're all pretty normal and. Whereas at the Paralympics, the the complete opposite the case is the case that everyone has got a, a an interesting story. Some of it's because of um, congenital um, deformities. Others are um, disease that they've picked up in their younger years. Others are heartbreaking accidents. Um, you know, there's the stories are just outrageously um, interesting, sometimes heartbreaking, and. So that's one element of it. But at the end of the day, as as my late great friend um, Maury Plant would say, the gun would go off and people will start racing. And so there's a lot of similarities between the Olympics and Paralympics because at the end of the day, it's just sport and it's great sport and, you know, you, you, we love watching it. Dave, you, you, you were in that unique position where you got to see the Olympics and the Paralympics and commentate on many wonderful events. I'd be really keen to hear, what was your favourite event to call from each of the Games um, and why? Oh, it's too difficult a question, Patria, because there's so many good ones. Um, from the Olympics, well, I'm obviously I'm biased about the, the the field events that I was doing at the, at the Olympics. So, you know, Kelsey Lee Barber's, ability to to rise to the occasion and get on the podium when she had so many issues was amazing. So was Nicola McDermott's high jump. Um, but calling with with Richard Fox and, and Jess's two races, um, you know, first the bronze and then coming back to win the gold medal was, was a personal highlight, um, no doubt about that, M mainly because of being able to share it with Richard. I felt like I was part of the family um, and I was in a little bubble having a, you know, a a barbecue with um, a, an Olympic gold medalist dad whilst the race was actually um, happening. And it just happened that, you know, three million Australians were eavesdropping. So that was amazing. Uh, the Paralympics, uh, look, I love Madison Di Rosario and what she was, what she, she did across all of her races. We saw her so often um, across all of her events to finally get the gold medal after a disappointing 5,000 where she, by her own admission, you know, had, race pretty poorly in terms of tactics but the marathon was just an enthralling event and to watch that unfold as the last event and have her be able to uh to roll into the stadium hold off the the best female athlete at the games in the wheelchair category and Manuela Shah of um, Switzerland to win the gold medal I think was that was probably the highlight and close to the highlight of of both experiences really um but look Bruce McAvaney style. I could I could rattle off every event because you know that's what makes the Olympics so special. We just we just love it. You know, sharing the gold medal and the high jump was amazing. Well, two Australians weren't involved. Um, there was a stack of highlights. That's for sure. Dave, uh, just in commentary, there appeared to be an evolution in the language used in the Paralympics, in particular, a, a real focus on ability rather than disability. Um, once the race, sure, there was the backstory, but once the race started, there was no real focus on on the disability. It was all about all about the ability to perform. Yeah, I don't think that was intentional. Um, I just think that's the evolution, and I think that's what um, how it should be. Unless the unless the disability or the impairment had an impact on the performance, and we did see that in a number. You know, Isis Holt and and James Turner in their particular. Um, cerebral palsy um, classifications, particularly James in the 400, his impairment impacts his performance in the latter half of the race because of the lactic acid. And so, if it was if it was a relevant component, then it was worth talking about. But otherwise, you know, if it was a 100 meter race, there are eight athletes on the start line, and they were having a race. And you could see that they were either in a wheelchair or that they had a, a blade or that they had one leg or two legs or they had an impairment in their arm or whatever it was. We didn't need to talk about that. It was obvious that that was the case. But at the end of the day, the classification system, whilst not 100% perfect in Paralympic sport, it, it 
groups like athletes with like athletes. So you don't you can remove that element of it and just concentrate on the performance. And I think you're right that you know what times they do are only relevant to the times that they do. So therefore you need to know their personal best, their season's best, the Paralympic records, the Olympic records. Because comparing them to able bodied athletes is ridiculous because in the wheelchair events they go you know, a minute faster, a minute and a half faster than, a, than an able-bodied 1,500-metre uh, runner. And in uh, the um, in other events, obviously, with there's no big point comparing Usain Bolt to the winner of the, you know, T6400 because they're com- two completely different athletes. So, yeah, it's interesting that you make that point. It's been raised with me a lot that, you know, we really did a great job of just talking about the athletes, but it wasn't something that was... It just comes naturally because that's what they're, – they're great athletes, so that's how we talk about them. I guess where I'm coming at is that at, in the past, and I've been guilty of this myself having commentated Paralympics and Olympics, is that there has been such a focus on, on the disability and um, just less so on tactics and more so on the fact, oh, you know, it's great that they're out there competing sort of thing, but that takes away from the fact that they are high-performance athletes in the various disciplines, and yeah. I think that I think there's been so much less of that. What I've noticed anyway in, in this commentary that has happened at these Paralympics is that you know there hasn't been that you know oh we're just happy to be there. Um, it, it's more about you know getting the best out of each person. Yeah, no doubt about that. And obviously, it helped with our experts. You know, I was blessed to have a great expert in Tim Matthews, who you know works for Paralympics Australia and knows so many of the stories of the athletes and has got such a good understanding of the classification, et cetera. And obviously with Kurt and with uh, Priya Cooper and all of the other experts that we had, um, it that helped. But again, the, the, the disability was only relevant to the class. So when, when Maddie D Rosario is competing in the T up, up against the T54s and she's a T53, then that's relevant. That's relevant to that conversation that she's her, you know, she's upper classification, but that's then you get on with the race, and and the rest of it is just sport. And um, yeah, I think that the audience needed to know some of that information, um, and they got enough of it. But then it was on to the the battle. And I think you know, Kurt said at the very beginning of the games that you 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 look past the disability and see the athlete. And I think that's what um, Australians enjoyed about watching it. David, uh, despite the obvious um, being it, it, the games, both games being affected by COVID, um, what what set these games apart from previous editions? I, I think for me personally, it was just the gratitude of the athletes to be there and be, be able to compete. Yeah, and you know, it, that came into sharp focus before the Olympics started when we heard from Susie O'Neill saying that there were athletes who were on the plane going saying that they couldn't believe that they were actually going that we'd finally got to this this point. So I think that that was, you know, they're all in it together. So there was an element of that, that every athlete, you know, from wherever they were from had issues in, in the lead up to the games. And Australians were probably less affected by that than than most. But in the final lead up to the games, if you were from Victoria or New South Wales, you know, you were still significantly impacted by lockdowns, et cetera. So, um, and from an audience perspective, you know, people, in the in the main in Australia were locked up in their homes, so they were they were watching th- this you know, amazing sporting spectacle through that prism. And I thought our athletes, you know, the question I've had a lot is, you know, what sort of media training the athletes have because they're also good at their interviews and et cetera, et cetera. And the answer virtually is none. You know, this, and and I think we enjoyed their their openness, their candor. We seem to have moved past if someone swears, drop the F-bomb, says something stupid, that's, you know, <laughs> hallelujah. You know, Kayleigh McEwen's interview was just awesome. Um, Riley Days was the same. Uh, Peter Boll was just extraordinary in his ability to talk about his experience and all of those things. So it, it all added it to it, didn't it? It was just layer by layer by layer. There wasn't a single thing. Competing in front of an empty stadium I don't even think we really even noticed that there weren't any fans there. It was it was bizarre, really. Maybe we just got used to it that, you know, sport now happens in in front of empty stadiums a lot. There seemed to be less of a focus on the medal table um, and 
people winning medals. You mentioned that Peter Bowl. I mean, one of the highlights of the Olympics, he didn't win a medal, uh, nor did Rowan Browning, Cedric Dubler. They emerged as some of the highlights. It wasn't all about medals. And it was the same with, with the Paralympics, not, not a focus. There was no medal predictions before the Olympics and Paralympics too. Yeah, and I, um, I've got to be a bit careful what I say here because, I, you know, my day job, we've got a goal to be number one in Birmingham um, and to win the medal tally. But uh, And I don't think that that's necessarily a bad thing. But I've, if I go back to my days when I was chair of selectors with Athletics Australia, this was, you know, after the Sydney Olympics in the lead up to Athens, I hated medal predictions because they're too hard to get. And they're too hard to win, and there's there's too many variables, particularly at the Olympic Games. If, if if there's a tipping competition in athletics for the Olympics, the world's greatest minds in athletics will get 50% of them wrong. So it's very rare that you get more than 50% of your tips at the Olympics in athletics correct. So that shows you how difficult um, winning uh, Olympic medals are. And Rowan Browning, for me, was a winner at the Games. Would have been great if he had made the final. Um, but if he finishes eighth in the 100-metre final at the Olympics, he doesn't finish last. He finishes eighth in the world. And so I think there has been a bit of a reframing there. I think the AOC benefited from that significantly because you know, I, I couldn't even tell you where they, where they finished on the medal tally. Um, was it fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth? Don't know. Um, to say that we've got to be top five and then you finish sixth and then we've failed because of that, uh, you know, is is tough, isn't it? And in Birmingham, we might be beaten by England, but I think as long as our athletes have a go, are well prepared, do what they did in Tokyo and that's a lot of per, uh, personal bests and season's bests and give it a whirl, I think most Australians are, are happy. If we go along and meekly surrender and um, fight our way to the back and don't have a go and behave like sport brats, then the Australian public will go, I don't think so, and that's fair enough. Yeah, look, we've been talking a lot about the, the bumper 12 months in, in sport that's been kicked off by Tokyo. There's a lot of uh, major events coming up, including um, Birmingham 2022 Commonwealth Games, multiple world championships in different sports as well. How do you think the athletes will sort of transition? I'm putting your former athlete hat yeah. on. Oh, it's going to be very difficult for them. Some, of the, some are, you know, already moving on. Um, you know, Jess Fox has gone back to the World Cup circuit and she's, um, you know, got a World Championships coming up. Emma McKeon's, you know, back in the pool with the International Swim League. So these things are happening and that's probably a good thing for athletes. Um, our Paralympians are probably, as we speak today, still in hotel quarantine. So they're still coming to terms with, with that. It's going to be a very difficult period for them. Um, but I think what they then get is a bit of a break after that. So it'll be different athletes will go, yep, yeah, this is this is my window. My window is open right now. How good is this? I can have a domestic season in Australia. I can um, go to a world championship. I can then go to the Commonwealth Games. I can compete internationally because we're allowed to, um, and I'm going to make the most of it. So, And from a, an Australian public's perspective, and, and you – you invented the term, I think, the um, the bumpy year of sport, Petrea. So it's it's an opportunity like no other to go from an Olympics to a Commonwealth Games, for instance. Normally we have two years, so we have this huge drop-off and then we have to rebuild again, whereas we, we can maintain a level of um, acknowledgement and interest in our athletes who compete for the green and gold, um, everyone's favourite team, Australia, um, and get behind them. So I think it's a great opportunity for them. It's going to be difficult for them to maintain the the momentum, particularly if we're bouncing in and out of lockdown still. We need to be free and they can train and they can do all of those things and not have to worry about it. Um, but, you know, what a great opportunity for, for them. I would have loved to have been an athlete in this situation and not have that two-year break. Um, I don't know about having a World Championships and a Commonwealth Games in the same year, but it is what it is. But the Winter Paralympics, Commonwealth Games, yeah. World Championships, then you've got Paris 2024. So, um, and, yeah. and that'll come around in a heartbeat, which I think is a really um, a good thing. for Four years is a long time. Three years doesn't seem as long. And in the middle of next year, it'll be two years. And um, you mentioned the Winter Olympics and Winter Paralympics. That, because, again, it's in prime time in Australia, uh, Channel 7 and broadcasting, it just like Pyeongchang was, the, the viewing audience will be extreme. And we've got so many good athletes in our winter team and our winter Paralympic team that um, Australians will love it. And then all of a sudden the Commonwealth Games is here and we're cheering for that. So it's it's an extraordinary time and 
I'm sure our athletes will make the most of it. The hope, of course, Dave, is that you know a lot of the young people watching it, uh, Paralympics, Olympics, World Championships, etc., are inspired to take up this book. The 2032 is around the corner with Brisbane, and and that's what the hope is, isn't it? You know, a, a young person with a disability says, oh, gee, I'd love to be at the Paralympics, or a young person um, who hasn't really thought about what they'd like to do in life and sees the Olympic Games and thinks, well, gee, that'd be great, wouldn't it? Oh, no doubt about that. And, you know, just as a young Patria or a young David did when, you know, I watched the Los Angeles Olympics in high school, my last year of high school, and didn't miss a moment of it. Um, and committed myself to be at the next Games in Seoul, which I was lucky enough to do. Um, there'll be a lot of that. And but, and I think the Paralympics, the interesting thing about the Paralympics, Tim, is that there'd be a lot of parents that would be worried about their, their young children who have got an, a disability, whether it's um, congenital or whether it's acquired. They would have been watching that thinking, you know what, there's nothing that my son or daughter can't do, whether it's for those with quite severe disabilities that can play boccia, or it's those with um, that are in a wheelchair or whatever it is, cerebral palsy, um, intellectual disability, they can see someone like Todd Hodgetts and go, that's what you know my son or daughter can be, like that guy who, who is all of a sudden having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the Prime Minister because of his performance. And you go back to medals, he finished seventh. In fact, he didn't even finish at all because he, he got a, did not start because he was late to the call room. It didn't matter. We loved him. Toddy, this is what it's all about. He it was, it was a ripper. Yeah. So I think that that's... Um, I think that that would have given a lot of people real encouragement and for young athletes you know, watching it, thinking that, you know, wow, Brisbane, Brisbane's a long time away, but if you're, if you're 10, you need every year, don't you? So you yeah. can, uh, you'll be in your twenties and away you go. Dave, uh, thanks very much for joining us. It's been great to have a chat, great work on the commentary. Um, I know that it sometimes can be a little bit of a low. You come out of a, a big block that you've had commentary-wise, like preparing for an exam, and then sort of uh, you got to, I guess, take a step back. Reality steps in, and you got to sort of, I guess, um, work out what you're going to do next. Well, I don't have any worry about that because I've got a very demanding chef to mission for the Commonwealth Games, who you know <laughs> is keeping me on track. So, yeah. um, now it is like an exam, and like an exam, Tim, I've almost forgotten all of it already. Yep, that's the way it is. All right, Dave, thanks very much for joining us. Great job uh, during your commentary stint for both the Paralympics and the Olympics with Channel 7. Thank you. Thank you. As I mentioned at the top of this podcast, this is the final episode in Sport Integrity, Australia's Clean and Gold podcast series. Our next podcast will return to the on-site series. And what a month it's been with both the Olympics and also Paralympics. Patria, many highlights. What were the highlights for you? Well, that's a tough question, Tim. Um, many highlights from across both the Olympics and Paralympics. Uh, you know, obviously there were some outstanding um, performances um, resulting in medals. Some didn't result in medals as well, which, um, you know, still I think, um, you know, are, are just as important when people strive to do their best and achieve personal bests and, and things like that. Um, I love seeing some of the new sports. I was quite taken with the... The BMX um, on the on the, the I think it's a freestyle BMX. Um, I really enjoyed watching the goalball in the Paralympics, and thought um, what an amazing sport. I'd actually like to have a have a go at it. It looked so much fun. So um, you know, like it was just amazing seeing seeing the variety of events on offer and um, being able to wit witness those um, with the amount of coverage there was as well. And we got a unique insight into some sports that we normally don't get to see and. I really enjoyed that component of it. Some of my highlights, Scooter versus Ahmed in the pool, um, both real characters. And I think that uh, that was that was one of the highlights. And we also had Cedric Dubler helping Ashley Maloney in the decathlon, where he was virtually a coach, even though he was a competitor at the same time. We also saw a little bit of that in the Paralympics as well, with athletes actually stopping to make sure their rivals finish the race. 
it's that's what sport's all about, isn't it? It's about the spirit in which it's um, conducted and 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 the way that the athletes approach it as well. It's it's not win at all costs. Um, you know, they're they're out there trying to do their best and and beat their competitors. But at the end of the day, I think there's that realization. Uh, for, for the vast majority of competitors that they're all human, they're all just out there trying to do their best and, you know, when the chips are down, they help each other. Good on you, Patria. Thanks very much for that. And thanks for listening. We'll see you soon with the Sport Integrity Australia Onside Series podcast. You've been listening to Onside, the official podcast of Sport Integrity Australia. Send in your podcast questions or suggestions to media at sportintegrity.gov.au. For more information on Sport Integrity Australia, please visit our website, www.sportintegrity.gov.au, or check out our Clean Sport app.